Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. All right, I'm sitting down with longtime friend Jason Budd and returning podcast guest. This is what, fourth time? Number four. Number four. Have we had somebody come on four times before? I know uh, Paul Ballard's been on a few times, okay. but I think um, number four. Yeah. We'll have to check the uh, we'll have to check the archives to see where we're at here. But um, I never thought when you first called me up to do the first one, and I was pretty hesitant, and you could tell them that. Yeah. Never thought I'd be back for number four, Trump. You know, I always figured you would be. I mean, you've got enough stories. Of course and you, you do. Yeah, I did. All, yeah. all this Well, time. you're still trying to get me to write my memoirs. Yeah, uh, I think I, you should. I really think you should. Yeah. We'll work baby steps, right? Yeah. So well, big plans maybe in October, but well, that'll come out later, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah. that'll be a fun announcement. Yeah. Well, right now, if people are watching this on YouTube, or if you're, even if you're listening on, through your normal podcast provider and the audio sounds a little bit different, hopefully it doesn't, but I'm using a travel kit at the moment. The studio is going under some renovations or doing some upgrades. So, uh, let us know, uh, in the comments, what it sounds like, what it looks like. And if we're going in the right direction here, uh, I'm sure we'll find out because, uh, people are pretty vocal about that anyways. Yeah. Uh, um, we were talking about wilderness survival Yeah. and it was something that, uh, was sort of on the back burner for a while. Cause you've had a fair bit of time in the mountains and in the woods and, Actually, since the last podcast we did with Dean, you have, um, you've been spending a fair bit of time outside. Why, why don't you give a little bit of an update of what, uh, what you've been up to before we start talking about wilderness survival? Yeah. Um, I think we mentioned, um, I was going on my assistant Alpine exam in the Cascades, 10 days. Right. Um, went down, did some pre-training and then I was successful on my assistant Alpine exam for the American Mountain Guide Association. Right. So um, I just need to complete the full rock exam and the full alpine exam, and that's pretty much done the IFMGA system, um, which is International Federation Mountain Guides Association. That's kind of what I set my sights on a few years back. Um, and I was recommended to come back, do the full alpine exam next year. Mm-hmm. And they recommended I go. I didn't bother applying for the full rock exam this year in October of November of Fed Rock. Right. The examiners told me, encouraged me, just go on the wait list. So yeah. I've done that. You got to start pulling some harder grades. So Okay. But uh, training up for that. And then uh, usually it, there's a very good chance that probably going to get on uh, a last minute opening in terms of like one to two to three days notice to move and then flight down to Red Rock, Vegas, rent a car and five days on the rock exam. So Exciting. That's kind of that. This winter, I'm looking forward to the winter because ski guide exam was done last year. So it's just cruising, having fun. Nice. Um, but Steph's uh, training for her full exam probably in the next one to two years. So we still got to do a lot of objective based okay. trips. So yeah, that's kind of what we achieved. Not moving forward. So it's been pretty slow. You haven't been doing much is what you're saying. Well, we did. <laughs> Came off the exam and took two weeks holidays and went yeah. back to the Cascades. Oh, and we good did all Because the problem with this is, I say the problem is that you, know, you just don't apply for the next exam. You have to build a resume. Mm. So we had to do so many grade, um, Alpine commitment grade level five climbs and right. then so many glacier routes and things. So we basically took two weeks holidays and just completed as much as we could. And then most of my time off from work, um, I've been out either guiding or, um, doing our trips. So we're building a resume. So beauty pretty much done for the full Alpine. My resume is complete. So, so needless to say, you've had a little bit of experience in the back country. You've had experience in the bush, both at the personal level and professional level. And, uh, it's that experience that I'm hoping we can kind of share some of the, uh, uh, 
mishaps. I know I've, I've had a few mishaps in the bush that, uh, I figured I could share with the audience and, uh, what I've learned from it. And, um, also, um, I see from what you've been through different things that have, yeah. uh, been, uh, perhaps shareable learning experiences as opposed to those unshareable learning experiences. Yeah. I think, um, it really comes down to, for me, um, back in, in, in the British army, we have a term, um, for, uh, what was the term? Um, not kit hoarder, kit monk, no. Gear um, junkie? <laughs> sort of like that. They yeah. have a term for it. Um, it'll come to me. Yeah, yeah. But, and uh, we talked about it, I think, on the first podcast where, you know, pretty much in the British Army, the only thing I wore issued were my socks. Right. 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 Um, everything else you could buy an altar. And I was always buying the lightest gear mm -hmm. um, or the most efficient gear or anything I could to make my life easier because mm -hmm. weight is an issue. Mm -hmm. And it that's some of the lessons I've learned that if I can be lighter, light is right. Mm. You also have that term pack light freeze at night. <laughs> yeah, so I've been there. Fo it's finding that balance and then carrying that into the outdoor community. Um, we, like the term we often use is a planned bivy. A bivy is where you're going to camp for the night and an unplanned bivy. Right. And a lot of people just default to saying, well, always pack as if you're going to spend the night. And I don't necessarily agree with that because mm -hmm. um, if you have lighter equipment, you can move faster. Mm -hmm. You can limit your exposure to the hazards. Might be the elements, might be overhead hazard, might be avalanches. And there's certain times of the day maybe you want to move through this terrain or it's safer. Right? Mm -hmm. Mornings tend to be safer, you know, for lots of reasons. Get an alpine start. Yeah, alpine start or... Uh, avalanches, you know, yep. solar effect, everything, right? So limiting your exposure to hazards is really critical. And if you're always lugging a tent and sleeping a bag around on a day trip, that day trip's going to go into an overnight trip. Yeah, you're going right? to be knackered too. <laughs> you're going to be knackered. Yeah. So the balance then on those day trips is, I always think of it this way, is like you're bringing enough equipment so you're not going to die, mm. right? You're mm -hmm. not going to die. You got to last 24 hours, mm -hmm. really. So you're going to be uncomfortable, but you're not going to die. And um, one of the um, stories that comes to mind that I can think back to is uh, the Elfin Lake, the winter route. You right. Know, the Elfin Lake um, marked trail route. Yeah. I think it's 24 kilometers return, mm -hmm. maybe a thousand meter gain. And you start in Squamish at the um, trailhead for the Red Heather. And then it's marked by rangers. And they basically have these bamboo poles that are every... 100, 200 meters along the winter route. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of people would travel in from the city on a Friday night and they just follow this marked route. So in terms of navigation, you don't need a lot of aid. You just follow the Yellow Brick Road, for example. Right. Right. Um, and this is back in 2010. Okay. So I'm dating myself back here. Going back a little bit, yeah. I had my very first set of backcountry skis. and I and remember those skis. Little skinny 60 underfoot. Yeah. 165, no idea. Yeah. Just to get me to... To the mountain to climb it. Yep. That was my concept, right? And my partner at the time, Laura and I, would, very adventurous, heading out into the backcountry, and um, we would, decided to do a day trip and have dinner at the hut, and then ski back with headlamps. Right. Um, back to the car. Yep. That was our plan. Marked up. Everything was kosher. Um and I'll admit, 2010, I wasn't probably aware of a lot of the weather forecasting, um, or maybe they weren't even as developed as they are now. Right. Right. So the weather forecasting was a big issue. Uh, but we always had the basics. You always had your transceiver, probe shovel, a yep. tarp, uh, warm jacket, spare gloves, spare hat, toque, beanie yep. for the UK. Yeah. Um, I think beanie in the US as well. Not sure. But toque. Yeah. yeah toque. Toque. You know, Gore-Tex jacket. Um, you know, the basics so that, you know, the concept was, is that you could last 24 hours if you needed to be. Mm. Um, so everything was fine. I think we set off probably mid morning, skinned up, got into the hut, probably early evening, four o'clock, had dinner. I opened the door last light and I started seeing precip, precipitation stuff yeah, yeah. happen. A little bit of the wind's picking up. And I'm like, well, let's go. This is going to be fun. I like moving in storms. I told you, yeah. like, I love storm skiing. Mm -hmm. So, hey, 
This is going to be great. And we got a marked route. What could go wrong? Right? Easy. Easy peasy, easy, right? Easy peasy. So we're carrying on and heading <laughs> up the ridge. And uh, the storm's building. And now it's black. Like, we're going. We've lost light. Mm-hmm. Headlamps is fine. And the storm, by the time we're about halfway along the ridge, it is completely ping pong ball. Mm-hmm. White out. And maybe you could see, you know, I, I couldn't see the next marker anymore. Right? Yeah. Marker's gone. Yeah. And I may have had a GPS, but, um, you know, I probably didn't drop any breadcrumbs. I probably had the parking lot, but that mm. doesn't necessarily going to be able to navigate off. And this is pre-iPhone, so my favorite navigation tools are Keltopo, Gaia, FatMap. Mm. Um, easily follow those in a whiteout, no problem. Mm-hmm. I could navigate us to within a couple meters of where I needed to be in a complete whiteout. Didn't have those tools. Right. Then, right? Um, we heavily relied on Map and Compass. But as you know, a map in a storm is not going to work too no, well. Yeah, right? not too, not too not hot. Not the best. But, you know, I probably didn't have a root card, so I didn't have my bearings. I didn't mm. have my legs down like a good soldier would, right? <laughs> and yeah. I still do all that. I still, we call it a white oak card um, for the mountains. Mm-hmm. So I still do it. Um, if I'm in unknown terrain, I'll make a white oak card. So if my iPhone piles in or something like that, I'll have a bearing. Uh, my backup navigation is always an altimeter. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the old SAS navigation on the routes. You just have map, compass, altimeter. Mm-hmm. And if you have a bearing with your altimeter, you'll know where you are along that line. Right. Map, simple. Right. Simple tools, right? So I did have a map because I was religious in that, you know, map, compass, altimeter. I did have that at the time. But bought, but my problem solving was I just need to get to the next marker, mm-hmm. right? Um so I'd have to leave Laura at one of the posts with her headlamp on, and I would do a 360 <laughs> to locate the next one. And that's how I was navigating. Right? Yeah. So hindsight, I would have just dug an emergency shelter, mm-hmm. right? So it's just a snow cave. Really, just find a wind lip, dig into the backside, get in, put your backpack backpack in. So it's, it's not like a, an igloo or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's just, but this was Olympics, and Laura was a volunteer, and her very first day was starting the next day, and she's mm. very, like, particular. She needed to be there, <laughs> so I also had that human factor mm-hmm. um, affecting my decision of where we need to keep going because she's gonna needs to volunteer the next day to be at her very first event, where everything told me I should just dig in right. <laughs> for the night, right? Yes, and wait it out. Yeah, storm's gonna be good. We we'll have some good skiing down in the day. It's fine, but. Um, I pressed on. Okay. And um, we we continued that, leaving her at one post. I do a head out, 360, find the next post, next bamboo marker. And then she just she followed the light. ski to me, yeah, yell yeah. at her, ski to me. Yeah. And that's how we got along the ridge. And I think the ridge is like maybe four or five kilometers. Okay. And that's how I got through this. And then at the certain point, then when you get to the descent of Paul Ridge into Red Heather, hmm. um, that's pretty easy. You know, you're going downhill from yep. there. So we're touring along there. But the elevation band changed and the snow changed to rain. Mm. So Gore-Tex is good. Yeah. And um, I see this party of two or three coming up, snowshoes. So they're transitioning from rain to snow. Oh, not Into fun. the Alpine. That's never good. That's no, never a good idea, fun. right? That's I avoid that at all. Like if there's a trip where we're starting in rain, going to the Alpine, I don't go. Yeah, right? yeah. So it's easier to go from snow to rain because mm-hmm. you're on your way out. Mm-hmm. And these guys have black uh, garbage bags over top oh, with the yeah. arms cut out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there was stuff hanging off it and everything. And I, and I said to the guys, <laughs> guys, like, really? What are you doing? And this is probably at midnight now too. Yeah. So that's how late we've gone. That's how long it's taken us to get there. And we're trying to tell these guys, like, not a good idea, honestly. I said, just go back to Red Heather and bivy there for the night. Mm-hmm. There's no turning them around. I have no idea if they made it, they didn't make it. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't in Squamish Star at the time anyway, so mm-hmm. no idea. But just watching them trucking off, you just say, you know, that term. I think we call it, well, I call that term the unconscious incompetent. Right. And then your conscious competent as you get more training, as right. we talked about. And we strive then to become, or I try to train my clients to be competent, confident, Conscious, confident. Yes, right? conscious and confident. And then you want to move into the unconscious, competent. Right? Yes. In that realm. So this is definitely the unconscious 
uh, incompetent. Right. You know? And it's just sheer luck. That, sheer luck, yeah. That, that's going to get them through it. Yeah. yeah. So never a good idea. Midnight, garbage bags, heading out. And you'd see that. I mean, my days in Squamish Star, that was pretty common to see. Yeah. You know, people are going out to rescue like that, right? I mean, I did the garbage bag thing when I was younger. I'm, there I'm is not, a point. Like people right. say when it's fully on sleet over your Gore-Tex, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> you know, you can carry it. For sure, I, you know. Well, I just did it because I didn't have any money. Yeah. I uh, would go to well, the boardroom or to, uh, where was it? Comor. I forget what it was. Yeah. Maybe it was Sport Check or something like this. And uh, rather than renting your skis or your board, you could uh, demo it there. And you get a brand yeah. new board. So you demo all the gear and it was way cheaper. But I would just put garbage bags on for all my gear. I looked like a goof on the slopes. But uh, yeah. uh, that was part of the learning experience. And that whole unconscious incompetent area is, and you and I were talking about this earlier, about the Dunning-Kruger effect. And I mean, for listeners who haven't heard of that one, I think more and more people talk about it now. It's a bit more common, but essentially the Dunning-Kruger effect, there's two guys, Mr. Dunning and Mr. Kruger in two different universities. And uh, they came up with a formula that showed a person's confidence level based on their uh, ability and the length of time they've been into a new skill and they would find a large bell curve where people get in they're like, Oh, I don't know anything. And they learn just a little bit. And all of a sudden their confidence levels through the roof. They figure I can do this. And the more and more that they learn, they realize, Holy crow, that was dangerous. Or I shouldn't have done that. Or I, I really am. I'm just scratching the tip of the iceberg. There's so much to yeah. know. I don't know if I'll ever know it. So all of a sudden they're, the more they know their confidence level starts coming down a bit. Cause they realize there's, they realize what they don't know. Well, I've always said AST1, Avalanche Skills Trainer 1 course, mm. our standard baseline course. We teach the students enough to get themselves into trouble. Right. Yes. So that's basically my takeaway that I get them to take away is like, you're just now more conscious of the actual hazards that's out there, right? Mm-hmm. So for sure, for sure. So thinking about that uh, whole Dunning-Kruger, I remember when I was... <laughs> What was I, 17, I think I was. And, uh, I decided to take my wood panel station wagon up a mountainside up past Kamloops and went to a location where I'd known, and I've been there a lot since I've been a little kid. And, uh, it was up a logging road and usually it's either, it was either a helicopter flight in or a, um, or a hike in. And for this, since the main road was quasi plowed, but the side roads had take you in there weren't, we had about a 21 K hike in. That's okay. I figured most of it, I'm going to be hiking on a, on a road. That's easy. Yeah. Right. Well, one thing I learned really quick at that age was the main road and the side roads look all the same when they're all snowed in, yeah. right? <laughs> Summertime that you can really tell the difference. What else did I learn? I learned maybe don't load your uh, backpack full of all the food and booze and everything else that you think you want to be bringing in and leave behind some essential equipment because you know, in the back of your head, I know how to get there. I know where yeah. it is. I'm fit. I'll just hike it in and we're good. It was about negative 12 out and, uh, it was, it was hard slogging through. I mean, we're, we're peg hole in every step. We had our snowshoes at, uh, uh, the guy at Mountain Magic, it's a store. It's not around anymore, but, uh, he stayed open on Christmas Eve so I could get off work and rent these snowsuits from him and then he gave me a deal on it. Nice guy. Uh, we we're peg hole and all, all the way in and end up getting lost going in there. Mm-hmm. And that was okay. I mean, like through the day it was, it was sunny, right? And so yeah. I've got my t-shirt on, it was negative 12, but I'm hot cause I'm working hard and heavy pack and, and, uh. Um, Probably a cotton t-shirt back then. It was a cotton yeah. t-shirt. Yes. <laughs> it, I love cotton, but yeah. it's not an outdoor shirt. No. Yeah. Uh, but, um, I remember we we're going in and. I was with two other people I was able to talk into going in and they, one guy wasn't quite as fit. The other guy was, uh, even less fit and it was, it was a long, slow slog and I was given a satellite maps that a, another fellow came up. He says, oh, we got these satellite photos that were taken by a logging company. You got to use them. It shows all the new clear cuts out there. So it'll make it easy for you. And I'd never navigated off sat photos before I'd, I'd use topos, right. I'd yeah. use map and compass, but, and so I'm just kind of looking around and looking at this thing. Good lesson. 
know your kit, know how to use it, right? Um, I just figured it would be easy. I, it would all make sense. And this is way pre-iPhone and this is pre-satellite photos, yeah. really. This was pretty standard. I mean, we used to get them in Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. So 2005, 7 era. Yeah. Never had them in Kosovo, Bosnia, but yeah, yeah they surfaced yeah, around this, that era, 2005 for me. So this. Except photographs, yeah. This was 94. Four around there, ninety three, and so yeah. I mean they they were doing it, like, doing the, it. but it's it was new for me. It's not like we had Google where we just go yeah. on and so uh, good Did learning. You didn't have life. Google Earth back then, Trump? No, or? not back then. No. Um, and I remember I thought I'm going to take a shortcut. I think I know <laughs> where it is, right? And I got a compass out, and I'm using these sat photos, and I'm going to take a shortcut through this area. And I was correct in what I was thinking. I just didn't realize the. Um, uh, the sat photo of course doesn't show the train and the, um, and the sun was going down and I went down this really steep embankment and I kept falling into the snow because there was, um, down trees that I was falling in between and, and, uh, and I remember I came back up and I was still wearing my t-shirt, right? And I didn't realize how cold I was getting. And the other two were really cold, but the sun's going down. And I, I finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to, they were waiting at the top because I was going to show them the way. And of course I ended up coming back up and, but everything was getting really dark for me. Like it seemed like it was getting darker than what the sunset was doing. Yeah. And I realized I'm not shaking or anything and maybe this is hypothermia. I don't know. I've read about this, right? So, um, I re- I got some kit on and tried to get some warm gear on and, uh, wanted to get moving as fast as I could. We're going back up a hill. And I told them, I said, look at, I, I'm not feeling right. There's something's not quite clicking. And, um, uh, if for whatever reason, cause it's getting darker and darker, if, if for whatever, whatever reason I happen to pass out, I'm pretty sure our destination is, and I point in the area and I think it's only going to be about another couple kilometers over that way. Just drop the packs and uh, drag me in. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, thankfully once I started to warm up a little bit and I had some kit on, things started feeling a little bit more optimistic and that doom and gloom feelings that kind of started to subside. Yeah. But the other two that I was with were, uh, really delving deep into this whole mental doom and gloom. And, and I asked him, I said, look at scale of one to 10, where are you at? 10, you're right as rain, zero, you're dead. Where are you at? And, uh, one guy's like, I don't know, like a four. <laughs> the other guy's like a two. <laughs> right? yeah. So, um, we ended up just through sheer determination and stupidity slogging in. And I remember when we finally found this one lake and it was all frozen over and that was the lake where we had to be. It took us 45 minutes to cross something that in the summertime would have taken you, I don't know, five, yeah. seven minutes to, to cross. And then I get to the, um, to the cabin and I figure, oh, this is great. I couldn't get the lock open cause the hands weren't working. I figured I'm going to have to knock the door down. We eventually find a way in and the thinking that everything would be great when you're in the cabin and not realizing until you get inside, it's the exact same temperature as everything yeah, outside. Okay. Um, fire got going. We're good. It's amazing how good yeah. you are once the fire gets going and you start to warm up a bit. And, uh, but there was a lot of learning lessons off of that. Know your kit, know what you're bringing with you. Don't bring untested stuff the very first yeah. time out. Um, I didn't really have much of a trip plan on that one. Um, w- maybe, maybe have a little bit lighter pack. Like it was heavy pack that I was packing in and, um, I mean, a bunch of fresh food, none of this freeze dried stuff. Right. I think I had a chicken or two in my backpack cause I wanted to cook those up. Um, so I've learned a lot since then yeah. on, um, what, what not to do and how to stay out of trouble and others. I mean, I was up there at another time in the winter and these other people had to break into our vehicle and make a shelter out of it because they, um, uh, they were lost and they found the vehicle there. Yeah. So yeah. Um, couple, couple little learning points on that one. I think between you and I, I probably have more of these survival type stories than you do. Yeah. Based <coughs> you mentioned that to me and they're like, let's hear the, your, um, you know, some of your survival stories. I'm like, Trav, I don't really have them that many. <laughs> and I've been out there. Yeah. And it have. comes down to that. And I've said that I've never had an unplanned bivy yet. Mm. Touch wood. I've never had to stay on a climbing route because I ran out of time, light, mm. or whatever. Um, and I think that really comes down to 
touch wood, um, mm. pretty good planning, preparation, right? Because right? I haven't had that experience. <laughs> of, I, I've had some, some um, I wouldn't call it near miss, but I mean, I got frostbite in my hand on, on Hector. Right. Similar, you know, uh, my Steffi and I were going up to ski Mount Hector. So Mount Hector, I think, is around 12,000 feet in the Rockies, near Mosquito Hostel, Icefield Parkway. And it was super cold. Maybe it was February. And um, we got a break. The conditions went to moderate for avalanche. Clear, sunny day. It's going to be minus 20. Mm. So we thought, let's go. And mm. I had these good Eteric gloves on. And if everyone hasn't done it, there's a gully you got to go up and it's faceted snow because it's so cold. Mm. And one of the things I had going on was I didn't have the uh, top of the glove cinched tight. Mm. And you basically ha are having to plunge step up this gully. You can't skin it. And I'm plunging up and um, the snow is going down the inside of my gloves. Mm. I didn't really clock it because I'm working hard, like you said. You're in right. a t-shirt. So I'm working hard, and the snow's going in my glove, and it's melting, but everything's fine. Everything's warm because I'm working. Mm. And then as we progressed up the mountain, just short of summiting, we took a break. And I maybe we talked about this in one of our podcasts, but I remember looking at a, at, at a smaller pair of gloves in my bag going, my hands are cold right now, mm -hmm. but I should put these gloves on, mm -hmm. but... They're not as thick as the ones I'm wearing, so I can't see it being any better. So I didn't change. Right. But I should have changed my gloves. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the wind was howling from, I guess it would have been coming from the northeast, but it was basically howling on this side of my face, mm -hmm. this side of it. So we got up there, summited, transitioned, beautiful ski down. It was phenomenal. Like we did this, I think it was maybe six hours up. I yeah. can't even remember. And we were 40 minutes back at the car. High fived at the car, got in the car, um, drove down the road. Uh, but I'll take a step back. So I did take my gloves out, mm. and I noticed on my pinky finger and all my fingers, it was, there was fleece. There was a liner yeah. inside the Gore-Tex Gatera glove. So the moisture went in, melted, moved outside the fleece, couldn't pass the leather barrier, mm. re refroze. Each finger had a like a cocoon of ice on it. Okay. Like this. So. I looked at it, didn't think anything of it. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Got in the car, <laughs> driving down the road. Two minutes later, hands start thawing out. I had to pull over. Dry heaving, agony. Painful. Incapacitated. Wow. I had basically, long story short, ended up with frostbite in my pinky. Um, frost nip. That's not from that track. I think that's ink or pencil or <laughs> I'm something. I'm just looking at it You're now. You're looking at it. Like yeah, black look. finger. I think that's from the pencil. Yeah, yeah. But actually, it's this finger. Um and we had to go to the hospital. I couldn't sleep that night. Mm. It's one of the most severe pain I've had was having frostbite. Go to the hospital the next day. And we had planned to go up and ski up in the Wapda and stay at Bow Hut. Mm. And the doc's like, you can't go back out and expose your, your finger. Because um, if you get a, another cold injury, you're amputating it mm. in the summer. Kind of like my fingers. I like my fingers. Right. So I had a lot going on when we got back to Whistler. Like we canceled the trip, came back. I was doing my ski instructor one and two. So I basically had to ski with mitts. Mm. And those heat pads for the rest of the winter. Mm. And to this day, my fingers are definitely affected, especially the ones that had frostbite in. Mm -hmm. So it's very subjected to the weather changes, wet. Um, but that was a lesson on that. Like when, when we said, when you know you should do something, and we talked about it, like yep. change, change your socks, tighten your boots, yep. fix the blister problem, change that soaking wet. Base layer, mm -hmm. change your gloves, change your toque, your toque soaking wet, you know, or adjust it. That's, those, that's, that's key. Yeah. Those little things of just the very small, the discipline to administrate mm -hmm. yourself to. Yeah. There's a pattern. We keep coming back to this. It right? is. And, yeah. but there's something else in there too, which is kind of interesting, which is you thought about it and went through your head. Maybe I should do this. And there is this weird little sixth sense type of thing that I don't think people should ignore, especially when they're out in a situation that could be, um, could have some dire consequences. If for whatever reason now I get a sense, even, you know, just around here, oh, I should probably pick this up. Someone's going to trip on yeah. it. The second that I think that 
it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I don't pick it up, somebody will end up tripping on that, right? So I've started to learn to really trust that gut feeling or that sixth sense. You know, Travin, uh, I was just telling you about a climb I did this this Sunday. It yeah. was called Goldilocks, mm. and it's up in Squamish, put up by Colin Morehouse. Uh, 15-pitch alpine climb, traditional climb is you place in your gear. Um, grade goes at, most of the pitches are like 10A, 10B. Mm. We felt that, they're un, um, undergraded. They could every pitch could be overgraded. So it's, it's a pretty significant climb. Right. One hour approach in. Uh, we were seven hours on route, which is pretty good. Twenty one minutes a pitch. So mm-hmm. we're always calculating and timing sure. everything, time estimates. But the walk off. There's a walk off. There's three ways to get down. We the route and call them. More health said, don't recommend it. Parties below you. There was no parties below us. Right. Loose rock. We didn't really see any loose rock. Yeah. Um, he did recommend somebody coming up and bolting. A, a decent rappel route off to the side. Mm. I have the hardware. I don't know if you want to. Sure. I could go do it. We'd take the gondola up. Sounds like fun. Let's do it. Repel ourselves in and bolt the route. But the other way is you walk back to the gondola and that wouldn't have worked for us because we would need another four by four to get back up the road. Mm. So he says there's a bushwhack, three hour bushwhack. And to do the rappel, you needed a 70 meter rope. We brought a 60 and I have this escaper. It allows me to rappel single and you can, pull it right it's not meant to do 15 wraps like that one wrap one off right this escaper is pretty cool i'll have to show it to you it's a pretty cool system sure. the bl escaper where you can turn your single rope into a 60 but we talked about it and then we didn't action it mm. and that's um there's two two rules that i kind of follow if i'm uncertain about something the first rule is get more info mm. right get more beta more info Mm. And the second rule is increase your margin of safety, right? So these are the two rules I apply when I'm planning to go in the backcountry. So you got to get your information if you're uncertain. And one way to create, like, for example, we could have increased our margin of safety for this route by bringing in a 70 meter route, though a 60 is adequate. Mm. But a 60 wouldn't be adequate to repel the route unless you have an escaper for some of the longer routes. And and I wouldn't, the escaper is more for emergency or that one-off repel. We talked about the 70, we didn't bring it, Mm. right? But there is ways of turning my 60 into a 70 without the escaper too. And that's some Jedi guide stuff that I can show you later on. Sure, sure. But we didn't even think about that either. And we both thought to ourselves at the top, it would have been nice to repel, but we set off on the bushwhack. And the bushwhack was horrible. It was literally jungle warfare, (laughs) one meter, like horrible bushwhacking for three hours to go back down to the forest service road. Should have wrapped. Should have wrapped. And and I said to Steph, I said, let's avoid trips now that involve bushwalking. Mm-hmm. When they say three hours of bushwalking, let's go find something else or find an, another. Even though our guts, our guts, you know, said, don't, like, bring a 70. Mm-hmm. Really think about wrapping, even though Colin said, don't wrap it. Totally wrap this route. Like right. they do in Red Rock. There'll be 20 parties trying to wrap a main popular <laughs> route, right? And I get it in the Rockies. When you have limestone and rockfall and, and mm-hmm. same up in Marble Canyon here, but this route's totally adequate. It's just not a very good rappel route. You, there's mm-hmm. a lot of horizontal movement and stuff, right? So, uh, you know, I think, you know, we, we talk about our guts and, and, you know, like, for example, I said, you know, I need to change my gloves, mm. right? But I didn't do it. Unfortunately, we often um, overpower that, Whatever that conscious um, influence is telling us to do something, Mm -hmm. we usually put it to our mental map after it's gone wrong. Right. And usually, you know, the incidents aren't significant enough to kill us, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Another mentor, Brent Peter says, his mountain guide says that, you know, some of the recreationally climbing we see is there should be more fatalities out there, but humans are really hard to kill. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a luck game, right? Yep. The survival game is actually, I believe it's really hard. Mm-hmm. And I see it so many times out there with wreck parties. But um, I think we need to make that mistake, survive <laughs> if <laughs> we can, put it to our mental map. And I'm, I rarely ever make that, is it, that mistake twice. And mm-hmm. um I'm probably my worst critic, 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 critic yes. on, on my exams. Yeah. I beat myself up harder than the examiners and, but, and I tell them that too. Like I really process, I analyze it for 24 hours where I made that mistake, mm-hmm. but my takeaway from it 
is I never make that mistake again. And mm. I tell the, the examiners that. I said, and I, I can actually put the examiner and the mistake and the exam I was on in my guiding stream mm-hmm. as a learning mental map. Mm-hmm. Where this guide said, you know, like, um, I can remember, for example, um, Mike Adolph, who is a our technical director for the ACMG, on my apprentice training in Whistler, the mm-hmm. Turing, I skied under the recreational um, uh, decker. Right. The recreational trail just goes under decker and you head out. Yeah. That's normal route. And he's like, Jay, I need you to take as an apprentice guide um, the safer option, right? I need you to take um, the lesser of two evils. And I put that to my mind. I'm like, yeah, that totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And recently this winter I was guiding Rainbow Peak. And Rainbow Peak has Gen Peak. And it's a really fun day trip. But I recommend the heli drop. I know a guy. (laughs) But you can do it. And Gen Peak is a frequent flyer. It usually kills one to two people a year. Mm Mm-hmm. And I had a, a client up there and we got to Gen Lake. I, I can't, maybe it's Gen Lake. It's the lake that's at the base of Gen Peak. Okay. We went out to the center of the lake, had our lunch, transitioned. Two wreck parties skinned right underneath Gen Peak and that's where they stopped. Mm. And I said, looking at this, I said, I know today we're at like 211 in terms of avalanche risk. Mm. It's bulletproof, nothing's going to happen. But do the recreational party know that? Mm-hmm. And I probably said, not. Probably not. Then I pulled up pictures of avalanches that almost reached the center of the lake mm. from the overhead above Gen Peak. And I said, I always default to the safer option. Mm. Even though I can actually make a hazard assessment and go, on this day, it's safe to stop where they did. I think it's just bad habit to get into. Mm-hmm. Right? So I think that's, you know. Well, that's a growing thing too. It is. Like you get yeah. older, you get, um, you see what could go wrong. When you're younger, you're invincible. Nothing's going to happen, right? Or you don't care yeah. if anything happens. Exactly. Um, you know, well, that's why they say like 25, uh, 20 to 25 is the highest fatality rate in young men. Mm. Is it more adventurous, less hazard? I could see awareness. that. Um, and it's interesting, and I always say this, like the, um, you know, the British Army has a matrix of what age you should be at what rank. You mm. know, privates 16 to... 18. Mm. Lance corporals are 18 to 21, 22. Mm. Section commanders, 23 to 25, mm-hmm. right? At that age, because they are leading the bayonet church. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were teaching those pre SAS selection courses for the core guys to go on the infantry training course, and I was one of the instructors, I remember one of the chief instructors saying, Section commanders are pit bulls being held by the platoon commander on a chain. Mm-hmm. And then the platoon commander releases them. And mm. that totally stuck with me and they were. Mm-hmm. And in Iraq, I was that. I was that cutting edge, mm-hmm. you know, leading the charges in, you know, in the buildings in um, El Mar Kabar and things like that. Um, and the time I rolled in Afghanistan, I was a platoon sergeant and I was happy to be one tactical bound back <laughs> from the assault <laughs> section. Because yes. the, what these boys got up to and what they had to do, I'm just like, you know, I was probably 28 then, mm-hmm. the old man at 28 in the platoon. Right. Um, where my Canadian counterpart, I met this warrant there from the RCR, one of my buddies, and I, we've talked about it. He was like 38 mm-hmm. doing the same jobs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but at 28, I was a voice of reason in that platoon. And I agree with you. I got 23 to 25 is pretty critical. Mm-hmm. Also the high, highest fatality, you know. Well, you've mentioned a couple of things. So uh, your phone, you're using the phone for mm-hmm. navigation and you're loving that. I love that. Yeah. Um, are you carrying backup battery power with you? A hundred percent. Okay. So there's certain things. So we, it's interesting now, um, like Murren Park outside Tuama, mm-hmm. people get lost sure. and call SAR. And if they had situational awareness, mm. they know that you got the ocean, mm-hmm. you got the highway, you got the mine, mm-hmm. and then you got the highway. Mm-hmm. You're going to walk in a direction. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get out. But they get lost. In a kilometer square footage, mm-hmm. and they call SAR. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really critical with your phone. If you find yourself in that situation, you have to um, save battery life. So airplane mode is really critical, but you can't obviously use your cell with airplane mode. Right. But if you have cell reception, then you need to call. That's your most primary thing right away is call. Mm. And everyone has an iPhone. I don't know anything else. Besides iPhones, all these other smartphones, but on the iPhone, they have a compass app mm-hmm. that comes with it. 
The Compass app has your long lot. All yeah. you got to do is call. When you call 911, they put you to the SAR manager. Open that Compass app and give them that long lot, and it gives you elevation. Yeah. They're going to find you. That's really critical. Mm. And often what happens is the SAR managers talk people through how to find their location. I highly recommend navigation apps like Gaia, Caltopo, um, Fat Map. Pretty big. I'm not a big Fat Map map guy myself. I really like Keltopple, mm-hmm. um, building routes, and then I import them into my Gaia. Okay. And I think Gaia is a really good navigation app yeah. to use, but I love Keltopple. You can build the route, it gives you the elevation, and then I, I calculate my speed distance time with this with another app called Guidespace yeah. that I use. So those three apps are my biggest tools is the guide pace. And the compass is good too. I love the compass mm-hmm. with ele- quick reference for elevation. Um, so when I'm obviously navigating, I go to airplane mode, close all your other apps, it drains it drains the phone. Mm. So airplane mode, also, I don't know if you know this, did you know if you charge your phone in airplane mode, it charges faster? I did not know that. You did not know that? I didn't this know that. in the game, trap. Really? Go Holy to airplane crow. mode and it's like, it it, it rock stars it in. I know. It's fast. I, I believe the newer phones, the iPhones will charge from like zero to 25 yeah. really quick. And then slower afterwards so they can get an emergency airplane charge mode, on. Try it. Like even in your truck, I, I've been doing airplane mode probably six, seven years now with iPhones. Interesting. Charges it. Like, you know, like for example. Um, like it makes sense. It's not going to have as much draw yeah. as you're charging like it. Often I uh, will have my, f- not start my truck, hmm. but just turn the key. So it's charging off the battery. Right. So I don't want to waste fuel, hmm. but I can waste enough battery in my truck hmm. to charge my phone, go to airplane mode, and it's a fraction of the time. So that's why you can carry a small cell. Uh, I think z- I like usually just carry the zeros or zeal, whatever. Goal zero? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Just the, a little golden. The, 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 the I little get guy. about four full charges out of it in yeah? airplane mode, yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, for longer trips, like I would say anything more than three days, I have a solar charge battery, small, probably the size of this notebook. Yep. And I've migrated to all my systems. My headlamp can be charged by that. Uh, my iPhone, my e-reader. So you're using a rechargeable headlamp, not a battery? Yeah, correct. Okay. And the rechargeable headlamp is good without bringing, like, um, I'm probably good for three days, mm. right? And to be honest, I try not to move that much at night anymore. Sure, <laughs> right? sure. It's like, I try not to, there is Alpine start, sure. We're, we're marching off, yep. right, 3 a.m. with headlamp. And you have different settings, so you go mm-hmm. really low light. If yeah. I'm t- technically climbing, then I'll go higher beam. So I save that energy for that lamp. So I'm using, um, yeah, I'm charging with that. So on Denali, I brought my iPhone, my e-reader, my headlamp, all got charged with this solar panel battery pack that was this size. Hmm. When it's that cold though, minus three at night, everything's got to go in the sleep bag. Right. All the, ba- anything batteries got to go in your sleep bag at that cold. Batteries don't like cold. Right. Yeah. yeah. Always in there. And, and your fuel canisters, but you should have fuel canisters on Denali unless you're climbing the more technical routes should be mm. white gas anyways, right? But um, all that is in your sleeping bag. So yeah, that definitely, if it's a day trip, I usually don't bring that spare um, battery. Mm-hmm. I'll just, I go straight to airplane mode. Okay. Just save my battery, right? And and you got to have it, your phone, as soon as you use that screen, close it. Mm-hmm. As in shut the phone off on the side, like not down, but like close that screen. Mm-hmm. I've had it where I've left it on the camera. Like you go to take a photo. And it stays on. Stays on. That just sucks the battery. Right. So you got to be really diligent. Like shut the phone off in the hibernation mode mm-hmm. right away. Boom. Save it. Right. Um, I try not to track too many maps. Like Gaia, when you, Gaia can track, Keltopo can track fat map. Mm-hmm. As soon as you do that, it just depletes the energy. Mm-hmm. of the phone. So often I'll just create my own maps anyways. Um, if it's key, I like, I really want to track this and I will track it. And then I'll ensure I have battery pack. So if I'm tracking on a day track, day trip, then I bring a spare battery. You know, another way I do as a guide now is I will build the route and share it with all my clients. Smart. So now everybody has it. So mm-hmm. that's backup navigation, mm-hmm. right? So everybody's on their iPhone has that, that route. Um, something comes to mind, we're talking about it, but, um, famous Alpine traverse called the, um, Halts route. 
in, okay. in the Alps. 2018, and a storm came in, and 16 people died. Right. Over that weekend. And one of the parties was a 10-person team um, led by a mountain guide and his wife. And they set off just pre-storm. It would have been better to probably hang out in one of the huts. Sure. And he got, there were, I think there were then four to 600 meters of, of the other hut on this ridge. They couldn't find the exit down. Mm-hmm. And his iPhone died. And um, eight people died that night in mm-hmm. his group, including him, the, the mountain guide. And one person did, I believe, have a GPS, but it wasn't getting shared or anything else. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing. Um, on a big expedition, I will bring a GPS and plot the basic points. Mm-hmm. Right? If you actually had the basic points. But I, I find the older GPSs, they're not as um, modernized. Right. With all the map layers and the navigation as their iPhones. Sure. Right? So there's that trade-off. And they're heavy. And heavy. But saying that, I do have a little <coughs> e-check that's like, you know. Right, the little guy. The little guy. Yeah. Right? But navigating, it's not the same. The right. waypoints and everything. But it would be good to drop ma- you know, critical waypoints. Like, mm. like for example, that um, critical descent route. Mm. You'd have the hut, the hut, and that critical descent route would be perfect. To do so, it's something like that. I'd have that in the group. I don't necessarily have to carry it, but you'd have that backup. But you know, honestly, for myself, um, I also carry an in reach, right? So, the I little one, the little I have the mini in reach, yeah. And this goes back to the basics again, where I can get my um, if my iPhone shuts down, I can turn on this in reach and I can get my UTM grid reference, right? So, if I have my map, you go, you're golden. I can find where I am on the map mm-hmm. and just plot my point. Now we're back to the old school map compass. So these are old skills that we, uh, even though they're old schools that you and I grew up on, um, don't pay lip service, right? Like mm-hmm. definitely you need to. Oh, it's worthwhile. Worthwhile understanding how to read a UTM grid. Yeah. I've, I've migrated from the military grid reference to the UTM. Mm. Um, I'm in and out in long lats. I don't think it's as accurate, but SAR likes the long lats. To okay. Get that and aviation's long lat. Yeah. But UTM is really important. I think it's the easiest way to navigate. Understand UTM. So you can take that navigation point from your in reach, mm. plot on the map, and that's my backup. But well, you have yeah. to have your GPS. So that's UTM, Universal Transverse Mercator. And yeah. that's so you can take a look at your map and exactly. shows you exactly what map you should be looking at and shows you exactly, yeah. if you know how to read it, you can see exactly where yeah. you are in the grid. And it, it is a, just a, the, the military grid reference system is a condensed version of that. Right. But, um, both are effective, mm. but I just find UTM now is just, it's, you don't have to convert anything. Easy. It's easy yeah. um, and understanding it. So I think that's really important. That's my backup mm-hmm. really is the map UTM compass altimeter. I carry an altimeter everywhere I go. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'd be what your watch or would that your be? watch, yeah, yeah. My watch. So you'd have to always zero that. Zero it in the morning, right? Yeah. It's kind of good too because now we're getting into the weather, mountain weather. Right. But, you know, you look at the barometer and the easiest layman's terms, if your barometer affects your altitude. Mm-hmm. So, like, if your um, altitude has gone up, you want to go down. Right. The most lame, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If the altitude's gone down, it goes up. And we can get right. more into the weather and barometer concept right. after. So you'd have a low pressure. Yeah, yeah, low pressure, high pressure systems, right? right? Layman terms. So that's one way, just another fun thing to look at, right? So, one thing that I tend to bring with me is um, I always like to have a way to make fire. And yeah. I always now bring a siltarp, some sort of a... 100%, out, yeah. So you're in the Alpine a lot more than I am. I'm in the bush, mo- mostly slogging through, but having a, um, a siltarp has been a godsend for us on, mm-hmm. on a number of occasions. And I, I remember we did a fly-in to uh, Spatsizi last year, and it was uh, myself, my wife, my son, and we were in quasi remote area. Well, I mean, remote area in so much as there's nobody around for miles and miles, but another group had also flown in. So we were at a base camp area and got up in the morning. We're going to hike up the mountainside. If we had an area, we're going to scope out. We're looking for caribou. And I, I remember we're going up there. We have our packs on going light as you can, but still have your yeah. kit with you because if things go well, you're going to be coming back heavy, right? So you're going to be coming yeah. back with an animal. And I, as we're 
slogging up the mountainside, this other group of guys comes racing up shorts and runners and, uh, and no packs or most of them. And they're running up past us. And my son's getting a little upset. He's like, man, we got up early. We're doing all this stuff. Yeah. We're, and these guys are going to come up and they're going to see the animals before we do. I'm like, don't worry about it. <laughs> Let's yeah. just keep going. Right. Anyways, we, uh, as we get higher and higher in elevation and the weather changes, this was in, uh, August, late August. And, uh, uh, starts raining, starts hailing, starts snowing, and then we're full on whiteout conditions when we're up there. And, uh, I said, well, let's just, we'll, we're going to sit down. We could either hike all the way back down the mountainside. Yeah. That's an option for us. Right. But why don't we just sit down, set up the tarp, stay warm. We can have a little bit of food to eat. And, uh, the other group that went running past us they, they petered out They're They're right back yeah. down the mountainside. We were out, we came back at sunset and, uh, uh, didn't, didn't find any caribou up there, but, uh, uh, just having a few essentials, a, a means to stay warm, uh, something to, uh, make a fire. Now we didn't make a fire up there, but we had our but thermal, could have. we could have yeah. had our thermal layers. We had our, um, uh, hard shells, but that tarp, man, Life changes. Your whole attitude and outlook changes when you're well, hunkered even, down. Even in the wintertime travel, like on my ski guide training, when we're, let's say, mechanized and you're waiting for the toboggan to come in, mm. it's amazing just wrapping like yourself in that silk tarp or whoever's injured. Right. It reflects the heat in right away. Right. Like it's crazy how much it shelters from the wind mm -hmm. and um, makes you warm. Steph just bought this one. It's really cool, uh, but it's the ones that you pull over and you sit in it and you get the different, there's two and a four person. Really? Yeah. It, I think it's from Rab. Okay. I'll send you yeah. the specs on it, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not like no, not no longer like tying it in like a tarp. Yeah. You just pull in it. If you have two people, they just sit on either side of it. Interesting. And it stays up. But well, that'd it's be really easy. cool at a blaze station because if it, all of a sudden you get caught in a shower, you just pull it over and you just stand there and it goes <laughs> out. So that's kind of a cool thing to look at. Yeah. Um, so especially if you're in a blizzard, you're not going to worry about um, trying to tie it up in trees and all that because you're still going to get hammered on the side. Right. But yeah, I'll give you the specs on it and maybe the listeners would be interested too. But um, it's a cool thing to add as well. Um, one thing that I have when I ski guide though, I have a rescue tarp. Okay. That's also to bargain, uh, toboggan. And huh. it's from Alpine Threadworks. Okay. So it's a little heavier. I think it's just under two pounds. But you can definitely, it's bigger than the soap tarps mm. and it converts to a toboggan. Cool. Um, check it out. Alpine Threadworks, so they're a rescue toboggan. You just sled down the side or you put your gear on it and... Uh, the skis. Okay. The split board can go inside of it. Got it. And then it has, uh, you can rig in, because we either have a rad rope, the six mil rope, mm. or even a five mil cord, mm -hmm. five meter, six mil cord can make a bridle. Okay. And if it's steeper, you can have a brake guy too. But... It's on YouTube, Alpine Threadworks. Um, Neil is, he's a ski guy that makes these. He's so backlogged. He had something like a couple hundred orders last year. Good for him. Um, yeah. So Good that's for kind him. of his thing. But check it out. The Alpine Threadworks um, rescue tarp, ski tarp. Uh, pretty cool to have for the winter time. You know, the reality is one person, we always say this stuff, we plan like one person, unless they're you, Trav, isn't going to drag somebody out. <laughs> but two people can make a good effort with one person. Sure. And one of my buddies, uh, Rory, um, and I think Robin, my other buddy, Sartek Rob, mm -hmm. Robin, um, Rory's wife, they were up skiing in um, the Sky Pilot Basin, mm -hmm. and she blew her knee out. And they called SAR, and it was starting to get dark, and Rory had the tarp. And um, instead of waiting for Squam or SAR to come, they actually wrapped her up, put the skis in, and they dragged her out. Nice. And I think they met them on the, um, there's a cat track on the way out. Yeah. But they actually pulled Rory's wife out of there with the bum knee. Yeah. Instead of waiting around, you know. And he's a ski guy. Sure, Robin's of Robin's at Sartek, so it was a no-brainer. Yeah. But um, often that's the case where, you know, you're relying on SAR and you can't. And the reality is, is like, I always tell people, this is really critical too, especially in the winter, is my turnaround times are really critical because... Um, if I'm ski guiding off Whistler or Blackholm, mm. I want to be back inbound by 3.30 mm -hmm. because it's dark by 5.30, mm -hmm. 5, 5.30. And in the spring, we can push that timing out later. But it really comes down to SAR being able to mobilize 
and the helicopter flight time. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's really critical in winter to dial back your objectives, start earlier. But it really comes to being somewhere safe by 3.30 because that limits, that's given SAR an hour and a half maximum time to respond. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's really critical to keep that in mind in the winter time and light because SAR can't fly at night. Well, I was saying that North Shore now has night vision. Right, right. But they may not come in a storm either. Mm -hmm. They often, SAR managers are like, dig in for the night. Oh, you know? A lot of the places that I'm heading, we, we don't have SAR that's going to be coming yeah. out for us. And it's, um, uh, and, and you, when you're talking about sharing the maps with the rest of the people mm -hmm. in your group, very smart, easy, easy to do. Everyone's going to yeah. have their cell phone with them. But that brings to mind, not just your kit, the things that you have with you. And we've talked a little bit about mindset, which is huge, but yeah. your pe the people in your group, knowing who you're going out with and their mindset. And I'll share a real quick story. Um, one of the guys that was on that trip that I took in when I was 17, 18 years old, and uh, they thought they're going to die out there. Yeah. In my head, that was never, death was never an option because yeah. my ADHD brain just never <laughs> thinks of consequences, right? It's just <laughs> consequence, ah, whatever. Yeah. I'm, I'm in the moment, right? And, yeah. uh, but they thought they were going to die. I didn't realize how bad they thought it was. And when, uh, a couple of years later, and instead of having the wood panel station wagon, I'd now have a, um, uh, a nice 1980 Ford F-250 half rusted out, but a uh, diesel truck and I got some chains for it. And I thought I can get us in closer yeah. to our objective this time with the chains on and we'll drive in as close as we can and we'll take off. And I talked one of these guys into going with me and that was a mistake because the, uh, having the right people with you who are in the right mental mind space makes one hell of a difference. We got in, sun's going down. I said, well, we'll just, I got a canopy on this thing. We're just going to camp in the canopy on the back. Yeah. Fine. Easy peasy. Right. And it was, you know, negative 12, 15 or whatever. So when, where we're at and, uh, this guy starts falling apart. I, I, he was saying and doing weird things that I, I'd not known him to be like that. I'm like, you know, I'll make you fire. Right. And so I find some wood and get a fire going and it's all burning through the, uh, the snow hard to keep it going, but we get something going that will throw a little bit of warmth and he brings out some food and he's e eating a couple bites out of it and he throws yeah. it in the fire. Like, what are you doing? Right. And then he's got his bottle of wine with him. He takes a couple <laughs> sips and he just dumps it in the fire. Like you put the fire out. What are you doing? Right. And then he's crying. Right. Yeah. And then like, what the, so, um, not pushing those in your group to the level that you think they should be able to, but objectively, just cause you can do it or you feel yeah. you can do it objectively, uh, gauging your group so that, um, you can maybe kind of do away with that ego. Cause he didn't want to say he was scared. He didn't want to say when he woke up in the morning, the next day, um, he said he didn't think he was going to survive the night. It was yeah. so cold. So I think. That's another piece of the survival puzzle is, uh, know who you're with. And you know, like you, you mentioned, a, I just took some notes there too, Trav, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, sharing that information in the group mm -hmm. is, and I share other things like the distance, the mm -hmm. elevation and the time, right? And it also a, a kit list. Um, What happens is, and what happened on that fatality there in the Alps, mm. and the article about it talked about um, the expert halo. So we follow the expert without question. And, you know, they talked about, well, everyone could have done a weather forecast. Sure. That was out there. They're all experienced ski mountaineers that hired a guide. And what they did wrong was they put the brains in neutral and just let this guide make his decision. And there's some of that... It, um, situations in Canada right now where, you know, it's gone to court and everything else and, and, and mm -hmm. the guide, they're the group through avalanche and everything else. Now, I'm not saying to hire a guide and then question every decision they make yeah, because be then fun. I'm not going to go out with you again. Right. Right. But there is that element of that expert halo and it could be simple as, you know, I'm in the mountains. Mm. So you're going to come out with me now. Mm. Right. And that, and I have friends, I have two, Ada and Richie. Yep. 
they put their brains in neutral. They go skiing with JJ for the day, <laughs> and they want that, which is great. And it's a, it's it's a guide day. Sure, I'm not taking any money for it. Yeah, but I'm actually responsible for them, and mm. I like it because I've been in charge and out sure. But they actually, and I also have a different level of risk, a mm-hmm. little higher. And I remember coming back into Disease Ridge, and it was a storm day. I love this storm skin. And there is elements that are convex on it. Mm. And you can still ski it. You can. It's like going through a minefield where the good terrain is. We had loads of snow probably a meter that night. And I remember going out. I remember in my briefing, the guys going, the safest route is just go straight down the ridge. Right. But dropping in is going to be the money. Yeah. And I remember going, um, this should be okay. <laughs> right? I'll go first. Yeah. And Ada's like, that's not good enough for me. Mm. I have a wife and and and, a and he's a and smart a guy. Yeah. He, he cal- he's a math, right? Oh, yeah. Calculate. That's right. This should work. It's not good enough. That's right. I've done the odds. It's, I've it's either got to go. It's either got to work or it's not. Yeah. And I said, you're a hundred percent right, Ada. We need to go down the ridge. Mm. And I even said that to myself. If I was guiding, mm. I wouldn't have considered this drop-in route. Right. I'm out with two buddies and they're following the expert halo. But Mm -hmm. the one good thing was I verbalized that decision-making with them. Mm. And Ad is like, yeah, um, I'm tapping out. We're not, I, this should go is not good enough. Good for him. Good for him. And we went down the ridge. Yeah. When he said that. And it was, and that was a good learning point for me Mm -hmm. in the guiding element too. It's like, this should go, doesn't cut it. Right. It's either going or it's not going. Mm -hmm. Right. And why is it not going? Right. So, but that expert halo is really critical. Um, and it could be simply now all of a sudden we're going to roll reversed. I'm going out hunting with you. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's been a while since I've been, I've been on the two way rifle range for a while. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but weapon safety, sure. um, packing for that element. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I, you know, I don't stalk cougars. Yeah. You know, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> easy, <laughs> easy job. <laughs> Buy uh, them a drink, right? You yeah, know, that's the standard, uh, standard one. Yep. Yeah, there's a cougar hanging around the base of the chief. Buy her drink. Yep. Yeah. Um, but maybe we should edit all that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, you know, that expert halo is really, really critical too, you know. Yes. Um, fire. What are you bringing for fire? So I used to be really keen yep. and collect lint yep. from the fire now. I usually have like, um, if you're on an overnight trip mm-hmm. and you have a burner, yeah, that is a really easy way to start a fire. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah it is. It'll dry everything out. Yeah. Um, in the past, on my uh, survival training with the SAR, mm. I've used a candle, mm-hmm. put the candle on the base, get the really small, really fine ground fall type, really thin branches. Mm -hmm. Use the candle as your base to get that going. Yep. Um, Often now I just bring um, like my toilet paper Mm -hmm. with a lighter. Mm -hmm. So I'm removing it in different elements, but you know, human waste is a big issue now. Right. And you know, there's a whole bunch of, you know, like in parks, they tell you to blue bag it out, like Mm -hmm. especially in the States. We're not so much in Canada, but we're getting more and more because imagine like if everybody had to poop at the base of the chief, right? Which is what's happening. Yeah, got poop everywhere. Um, but there's just dis- different disposals: the cat versus smearing your waste on a rock and everything else. Yeah. But ultimately, if you can burn your toilet paper, that is a good option if you don't pack it out. Right. So my toilet paper and my lighter are in a waterproof bag, and they go hand in hand. Okay. Because if there's not a fire, I'm not worried about starting a forest fire. I'm going to burn my toilet paper, right? Mm. Um, so that would be my. F- Basically, that's my fire starter kit okay. that I'm using right now. Um, I don't get, you know, the flint yeah. scratch. L- little little piezo, piezo uh, lighter, not Just one of the... Just a lighter. Yeah. You know, and everyone has in a group. Yep. I always tell everyone, bring a lighter in a group and we have it, yep. right? Because um, ultimately, that's all good, Trav, but w- you heard the rule of three. Yeah. Right? Three minutes yep. for oxygen, yep. three days for water, three mm-hmm. weeks for food. Mm-hmm. Right? Those are the three yeah. <laughs> that you need to survive out there. Yeah. The rest, anything else is a bonus. And I'm not saying just like, you know, go light <laughs> completely. Yeah. yeah it's too light. Going too light's light. fine as yeah. long as you know when to turn around. Yeah. The whole Mark Twight philosophy, right? For sure. So, you know, that's pretty much my fire starter at this point mm. that I'm doing, right? Either I have the stove, which will aid in that fire starter. Yeah. Um, candle. 
Candle's really good. I think a candle a candle That's wrapped like. up in um, tin foil because mm-hmm. it can also melt snow. Right. Right for that water if you need it. You know, in that night. But you can also like in a water bottle if if you have a hard water bottle, if you got water, just fill the snow in it, kind of melts it down. Because mm-hmm. ultimately, I'll be honest, Trav. I'm just surviving for 24 hours. Right. Because if you're caught in a storm, if you can survive that 24 hours, SAR can find you in the morning. Right. When it clears. Yeah. You've got to survive 24 hours. And mm-hmm. that's how you got to think about it. So if that means you've got to bring a tent and a sleep bag everywhere you go, well then, sure. But you're also going to suffer. Right. But can I dig a snow shelter, wrap up in a tarp? Um, you know, do I need water in that 24 hours? There's ways of getting water in that sure. snow shelter, right? Um, or maybe it's in the summertime. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I think. I think 24 hours, you know. Can that storm go longer? Yes, you know. But there might be contingency plans placed mm-hmm. by SAR. Like, for example, we can't fly in the storm, but SAR migrated in Squamish to go into snowmobiles, mm-hmm. right? And the first time they did it, they just recruited some yahoos. <laughs> that didn't go too well. <laughs> SAR being towed or on the back and getting bounced off and everything Whoops. else. So we have some, f- well, I say I'm not part of Squamish, sorry, right now, I'll leave absent, but um, there's some phenomenal um, snowmobile guides. Mm-hmm. Some mom, phenomenal, that train the SAR do annual training, and then they go out and they're qualified now. They have quads, um, snowmobiles, all internal. So instead of recruiting the yahoos, <laughs> they go <laughs> up in the back 40 now, right? Yeah. So. So um, some way to communicate. Uh, something to kind of keep you warm enough and sheltered throughout the night. Shelter. You know, and that communication is interesting too, because I carry, we work off guides, work off a three bank system. So cell phone in reach radio. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first tier for the most part is my cell phone mm-hmm. in reach. And then radio is more to deal with internal. Mm-hmm. So I know like if you're ski guiding on the, in the back of black home, we monitor the ACMG channel because my first level of rescue is going to be other guides. Right. So we monitor all the ACMG. We chat. Even though we're not working for the same company, we'll do a heads up. Hey, you know, maybe a um, skier accidental. Mm. This slope, this elevation on this layer, we just radio it out, mm. and, you know, and everybody's aware. So that's our first form. And then often what I like to do now is I may split the comms up, communications between the group. No point... The guide, for example, having all that radio, and then I'm in the bottom of the crevasse, right? Right. Having all the equipment. Mm-hmm. So maybe I keep the radio, I'll give you the inReach. Mm-hmm. I show them how to operate the inReach. This is, we got to just hit the SOS button. So for example, um, I was guiding on Garibaldi, uh, Mount Garibaldi, um, 24 kilometer return. And in the car park, I did a quick brief. Uh, this is my radio. Um, this is the inReach. We may or may not have cell reception. Mm. And... The party at three was, you know, I'm still concerned about crevasse rescue. The guide's up front. So basically, I, when we hit the glacier, I did a demo on how to transfer the load to a picket mm-hmm. and then hit the SOS on then reach. Right. And I said, I'm either climbing out or SAR is going to fly out. Right. Or Ross is going to fly over from the Tantalus. Mm. And I said, also, here's Ross's number. <laughs> and Ross is going to fly over. That right. That was part of our emergency action plan. Emergency response plan was that I, I can't expect these clients to haul me out. It's not going to happen. But I'm going to climb out, mm. you know, would be my plan. Um, and that communications actually came into play because we were talking about it earlier was that the clients, um, it was a very big trip. Mm-hmm. They weren't given the heli option in and heli option out. Right. And when we were just below the summit called the return, walked out and I realized, um, the f- you know, the fastest this trip's been guided has been 10 hours mm-hmm. that recently. And... Um, we were on par for an 18 hour day. Right. So I was able to get to high ground with the cell reception and get a call out for the heli company. And I, they would pick up the clients at the, um, park boundary. Mm. So I loaded them in and they were off. Um, so, so they're happy, happy aside from the, uh, the extra expense of the helicopter, but yeah. that's, uh, they're happy and they would have liked the heli drop on the way in too. Right. So that's a good takeaway too. Get the heli option yes. both ways, right? Not just, oh, by the way, Hey, there is an heli, heli option out of this if we need it. And I could have done it within in reach cause I often have the chief pilots of every company mm. on my in reach. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them like Ben from, um, who's the operation manager there from shout out to Ben Blackcomb Helis. Uh, Black Home Heli, 
Squamish Whistler. Yep. Um, he's in my in reach, and he said, "All I need is a long lot, and I'll come get you anytime." Nice, right? And then Darren from Black Tusk, same same sort of deal. Yep. You know, two great pilots, and they'll give him a long lot. Worry about the finance after. <laughs> right? Yeah, you'll owe them. And you come out. So that's good. Split the comms up. Mm. Your communications, right, within your group. Yeah, communicate the plan to everybody. Split the yeah. comms up, smart. Um, Fire, warm, yeah. navigation, compass, altimeter. Last year, 24 hours. Yeah. And you're golden. You know, I, I find a lot of people can go down the rabbit hole of looking at survival gear. And I'll admit, I've played with a whole... A whole bunch of different types yeah. in the past, and I keep coming back t- to the basics. It's uh, it's neat. It looks Gucci, but it's more weight in your pack, and it's. Uh, I found the heavier my pack gets, the more likelihood I'm going to find I'm going to find myself needing yeah. to use all that gear there. Um, so being able to get through the night and get to wherever you need to go, uh without overdoing all of the, uh, geeking out on all the kit, mm-hmm. I think is a smart. It's smart. And, um, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is first aid and what level of first aid kit you should have. Right. And I think it really comes down to the basics. Like you should, tourniquets are the new fad right now. Yeah. They're all using them again. Yeah. Uh, I have tourniquet in my kit. Yeah. Pocket mask. Yeah. Is, goes in my kit. And, uh, Sam Splint. Yep. Um, and that's kind of like the team element. And mm-hmm. I have some couple major bleeds. Yeah. Um, Just like ab pads or. Yeah. yeah. You know, like trauma dressings, kind of yeah. like had in the military. And then, uh, you know, basic stuff after that. Tape, band-aids. Um, Which are the ones that get used all the time. Yeah. And then I always tell people they need a pers- small personal. Like maybe you need blister kit. Maybe mm-hmm. you need like maybe another bit of tape, things like that. So I'll keep it. Maybe the team, like, I don't think we need 10 turning keys out. Mm-hmm. We don't need 10 pocket masks, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> so I try to do that. Um, I know for myself, I've had some medical problems in the past, like um, that H. pylori bacteria. Yeah, that was crazy. Did a normal in my guts where I ended up with um, eroding esophagus, loads of ulcers, mm. came to light on the second trip to Nally with a GI bleed, right? Right. So I carry, uh, one thing that aggravates my tummy is um, dehydrated food. I love that you call it your tummy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a British, British term coming out of my, my tummy chops. Yeah. But um, due to this, to the ulcers and things, like yeah. I've on like dehydrated food is light. Mm. Right? It sucks, but it's light. So short trips, we go to that. Big expeditions, we're gonna bring her more fresh food for the first couple of weeks. But I've even migrated now. I know what my 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 stomach Yes. Not tell me. Um, <laughs> appreciates. It's, I, I really, the only meal I eat for dinner is mac and cheese now. Yeah. Nothing it, wrong with mac and cheese. And it has the same calorie content, a little bit more fat than the others. Yeah. Same protein. And my system digests it problems. As soon as I start getting the lentils, the rice, mm. the meats, it aggravates my stomach. So one thing in my own first aid kit now is I carry, um, any acid pills. Mm. So for example, if I'm going away on a trip, I start doing the dosage and their prescription. Okay. So there's, I carry seven yeah. with me on the expeditions and stuff, but like if I'm going away on a trip, I'll start taking the antiacids prior, mm. maybe three, four days, get in the zone. I have them there on the trip. I'll take them during the trip. Um, and I ensure that I won't have any problems with my stomach. Um, three years ago, for whatever reason, I started getting migraines. Mm. So, um, one thing with the ulcers, I wasn't able to take ibuprofen for years. Mm. So now Tylenol doesn't do the same effect, right? Ibuprofen works. Ibuprofen works. So my stomach, my tummy is <laughs> diligent enough now that I can take ibuprofen mm. a lot in one dose, but I can't be on it regularly. So this migraine that came up three years ago, it knocked me out for, in bed for seven days. I've never had a migraine in my life. I've had two more attacks this spring. Mm-hmm. Um, doing research, uh, who knew, but like red wine is a migraine, in, um, cause and dark chocolate. I think some people knew that. Yeah. And I actually, um, love red wine. Yeah. I don't drink it anymore. Yeah. Both times I've had it twice in Migraines. the spring. Migraine. Bad. And so now, um, I find long days with dehydration will trigger because a headache and a Dehydration headaches different than migraines. Right. But I keep two 
rapid migraine pills in my first aid kit too. So hmm. any in inclination, like I can't explain it more than like migraines, like the back of your eyeballs start to hurt. Yep. There's pressure in different places. Um, I just know when I'm having a migraine attack and I actually had one not too long ago the next day after uh, being out in the Alpine. Hmm. Um, carrying in, it's different than a headache. Hmm. And I just, so I keep two of those with the antiacid pills. So these are my specialized first aid kit. And that's, that definitely helps with the comfort. Um, no fun being out there in the back country with migraines. I, after a, a car accident I was in, they sent me to a pain doctor and they were talking about managing pain and, uh, um, ibuprofen works. He says, you don't chase the pain, you hammer it. Yeah. When it comes on, if you feel the migraine, something coming on, you don't just take one, you, you yeah. take two extra strength gel cap Advils and hammer it. If that doesn't work, do it again. Yeah. And then you, you can small updates as you go through. Terrible on the stomach, I'm sure, yeah. but, um, but it manages the pain. Yeah. When you're, you know, I, um, buddy Richmond fire and uh, he was with a group number of years ago. And they did, uh, Denali. They didn't get the summit out of it, but, um, uh, he said he was able to get morphine to, uh, they take out in up, up the mountain. Is that something that, uh, anyone's bringing up with them yeah. and uh, just in case <laughs> morphine pills? Yeah. Or, or did he have a special kind of connection? He probably did. Maybe some paramedic gotcha. type level in that probably. I think I know his connection. Yeah. He probably okay. um, was able to do it. Okay. I think that's probably a, a good, now you're, you're spending most of your time in cold weather environments. And I know in, uh, in British Columbia here, most in Canada, most of the people who are going to be going out and enjoying the bush who are interested in, um, hunting or fishing. And a lot of that's going to be in the, uh, the fall seasons or the mm -hmm. spring seasons when it's going to be a bit colder, but they're, uh, warmer does tend to be easier in some respects so you don't have as much kit with you, but there are other considerations that you were talking about with like dehydration headaches. And yeah. Like for sure. Like this summer, heat stroke. our cascades were all high thirties Yeah, on the, on the glacier. And that's a different, that's a different kettle of fish. Yeah. Like knowing how to move on glaciers or hot environment and still move mm. loose layers. I'm all about the sun shirts now, long sleeve sun shirts. BD makes a good one. Yeah. Outdoor research. I had a uh, a guy on um, an intro to mountaineering course, mm. short sleeved. Mm -hmm. um, day one snow school, complete lobster, and the day two we took him out to the Alpine, and he was just completely dehydrated. Fried. One kid didn't have glacier glasses, right? Didn't have any sunglasses. Two days, mm. right? Things like that. And they learned some really valuable lessons. Yeah, on this, but yeah, like moving glaciers is actually quite like on Denali. It could be you're in a t-shirt. And then it's minus 30 that night. Right. So that's interesting too now is the extreme changes. Mm. Um, Steph and I were climbing in Shuxton and we were trying to go really light. We were, it was just the light over, over bags, which were fine, but it was getting so cold in the Alpine at night that we had to go to our zero sleep bags. And um, it's that sudden change. And that usually starts, I find, and it, I remember also being in the, you know, Canadian forces in Wainwright, August is that sudden change. 30 during the day. And then almost zero at night. Right. And that's the change that I find is actually I'm colder then and then I am minus 10, right. 15 in the winter. Camping. Mm -hmm. Right. It's that, it's that change in the system. Yeah. That's hard to plan for. Yeah. It's a bit of a shock to the system plus the humidity in the air for whatever reason mm. when you get down to around zero and it's humid yeah. out, it's, it feels colder when it's negative 10. Well, it's actually scientific because people always say, Oh, it's, it's a wet cold. And right. It? But there's actually science behind it. Yeah. That the humidity air, when it's colder, is actually colder. <laughs> I believe it. It, it actually has to do with like, you know, if we, we perspire, yeah. we, we'll be cool. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happening with our humid air. So that's why people in Winnipeg always say, oh, you know, West Coasters complaining about that, you know. It's cold. <laughs> like my friend um, Posty came out to spend um, Christmas 2003 in Edinburgh. Yeah. And uh, she was an officer of Canadian Forces, born in Ontario, maybe minus 15. Yeah. And it was maybe zero in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. the windy Sydney mm -hmm. off the North Atlantic. She had never been so cold. Yeah. At zero. Yeah, I believe in it. In Scotland. I believe compared it. to being minus 15. And it was a completely different experience for her, you know, so. 
Yeah. Well, why don't uh, we look at wrapping it up here. If there's anything else that uh, we should be talking about, I'm sure the listeners will uh, will write their comments in and um, and request it. But I think those are sort of my main things that I like to have with me. The number one is my mindset, right? My mindset and my survival attitude, like what you're talking about, having the, um, uh, taking the path of least resistance, the safer path between mm-hmm. the two. That's something that I've had to learn and I'm still working on. Still working on it. I'm still the working on option, that one. safer option, right? The safer option. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, when you're young and dumb and male ego and all the rest, right. And I can do it and you do, and you figure it out. But that, that little threshold there, that knife's blade that we tend to walk on between life and death. Yeah. yeah we are very robust, but there is also a very... And we aren't in some ways, right? Yeah. Um, I think those are the biggest things that you can take away from a survival mindset is the attitude and the mindset. Then it comes down to communication. Then it starts yeah. coming down to the kit in the order that you gave. And to summarize, to summarize, the final point we didn't talk about is fitness. Oh yeah. Witness the fitness. Yes. Right? So that's critical. Mm. Um, I discovered strength training in my... 40s. Right. I wish I just did it in my 30s. And right. I tell any of these young guys, like, instead of working out to look good, strength training. Right. But that's so critical. Being able to move fast through the train mm. at a safe speed limits your exposure and the impact on your body. Functional. So you want to do this a long term. Yeah. Right. Uh, Keith Reed, mountain guide up in Whistler, was talking about he must be in his mid 60s and he's an examiner, heli ski guide, still doing it. But he was talking about. The young guys are going to jump off the cliff. Mm-hmm. The older guys are going to ski around the cliff. Still right. get to where you're going. Yeah. Right? But as you're older age, you're not going to be dropping off the cliff. Mm-hmm. You're still skiing the slope. Yeah. You're not doing the big drop. Maybe so. I still find little drops, <laughs> but I'm not doing big drops. <laughs> right. Right. So I think fitness is so critical. You want to be able to move fast, limit your exposure, and then you don't become a casualty yourself. Mm-hmm. Heat stroke, cold injury, and all that stuff. Right. So fitness is really critical. Yeah. Start small, go big. Yeah. Fitness, I like it. And it helps a mindset too. Yeah. Because you can think. And, and you know, like one, I, one trip I did with Brent Ferry Meadows Hut. And the very first day we went off, Brent likes to get up, set the pace. First day we're doing this big, um, big summit. Mm. And I had the Aterric, um Avi bag. Yeah. And the Aterric Avi bag was nine pounds. Mm. Plus all the guy gear. I got 30 plus pound bag now. Mm-hmm. And I came from sea level. Mm-hmm. We're up in the uh, Rogers Pass. Mm-hmm. And I was exhausted as the second guide on this trip. And luckily, I packed a 30 liter Aterric Alpha um, Alpine bag. Yeah. So I could barely get all my guide kit in it. But yes, I'm limiting myself for being in an avalanche. Yeah. But I have more energy to make conscious, correct decisions. Mm. I'm more physically and like robustly can lead up front, break trail. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was just mentally there, Mm -hmm. you know? So that's, there's big debate about the Avi bag. I I own two Avi bags, maybe three, but (laughs) there's a time and a place for it. Like heli ski and I have an Avi bag and I have a touring bag for when the conditions storm indicate do it. Mm. But I mean, we could talk about this in another podcast sure. and there is podcasts about it, yeah. about Avi bag, not Avi bag and the mindset with it. Mm-hmm. But there was a, that, there was a time there, like I just ditched eight pounds right away, made a huge difference for the rest of the trip. Yeah. And that you mindset, know. well, fitness, like you were saying before, huge, uh, changes how you, how, changes how you make decisions, Ch- yeah. changes the outcome of your day and the reliance on kit is yeah. one of those things relying on a navy bag well that's extra weight and i'm going slow relying on all the yeah. cool kit that you found at the store um I, I think really when it comes down to uh wilderness survival mindset um communications like, yeah. like you're saying there having enough proper equipment to survive not necessarily being living in the lap of luxury while yeah. you're out there and that changes. Like Squamish, a windbreaker mm. is enough for the night. Yeah. But as we move into fall, then you start, you know, your micro fleece and then mm-hmm. move into your puffy. But going to the Rockies right now, I'm I'm bringing puffy pants and a puffy jacket. Yeah. Right? 
yeah. spare gloves and everything else. So you just got to do your homework, get the information. It comes back to that uncertainty, you know, get more info, increase your margin of safety. Awesome. Jace, thanks very much for coming on the Silver Core yeah. podcast, time number four. Number four. Looking forward to time number five. I think that's worth the handshake. Right? I do too. <laughs> right on, brother. <laughs>